This is Carl Cotton. It's 1953, a time when it's surprising to see an African-American man working on exhibits in a museum. I'd always been intrigued by him, and so was Rita Brooks, who works in exhibitions today. She saw this photo when searching for inspiration for Black History Month and put a call out to other staff members in the museum to find out more about him. Together, they dug deeper, reading work logs and scouring the archives. But to do Carl's legacy justice, they needed to look beyond his records and photos. So in late 2019, we took to social media to find Carl's friends and family who responded with remembrances, photos, and tons of fun stories. During this exchange, it became clear that he was a true Renaissance man who influenced almost every department at the Field Museum and beyond. Carl's childhood friend, noted historian Timuel Black, says Carl taught himself taxidermy at a young age, starting by artistically mounting the small animals he found dead in his Southside Chicago community and memorializing the departed pets of his neighbors and friends. At 22, Carl sent his first letter to the Field Museum, expressing interest in taxidermy and reptiles, noting that he had kept a collection of 30 venomous and non-venomous live snakes himself. They turned him down, but Carl didn't give up. After serving in Hawaii during World War II, Carl sent another letter asking for a volunteer position, which seemed to do the trick. Just over a month later, Carl had shown himself to be satisfactory in every way, and he was hired to work full-time in the now bygone division of anatomy. Carl Cotton worked at the museum from 1947 until his death in 1971. Carl did fulfill his dreams of working with reptiles. His alligator snapping turtle, still on display, shows his attention to detail, artistry, and that his experience working and living with reptiles paid off. It was created using a technique called the Walters method, where an animal is posed and made into a mold, which was painted with a mixture of celluloid, an early plastic, and pigment to create something between hyper-realistic sculpture and taxidermy. While it was invented by his mentor, Leon Walters, Carl is recognized for perfecting the technique, going on to train other taxidermists in this method. Soon after Carl was hired, he was transferred to the Division of Birds, where he taxidermied much of the birds you can still see on display today. One of his most stunning pieces was the 16-foot-tall sculpture called Colorful birds he created with museum staff artist E. John Feifner, which included 56 birds. This display broke away from traditional zoology exhibit design. The specimens are artfully displayed on seemingly improvised curves. It could have been inspired by jazz culture, with the feeling of spontaneity in the poses and dramatic colors of the birds. It looks like music, beautiful and accessible. Austin Rand, the chief curator of zoology at the time, said, The openness, the airiness, and the liveliness of the twisting and turning strands of metal as as they swirl upward, make the wire structure a particularly appropriate place for birds to perch and accentuate the beauty and grace of these creatures of the air. As the elephants in Stanley Field Hall have become a sort of symbol or trademark of the museum, so it may be that this arrangement of gay birds will become the trademark of our bird halls. Unfortunately, it was not to be, as the piece was dismantled in 1990. Even so, many of Carl's birds are still on display, like this bird of paradise and macaw. You can identify which birds were a part of the sculpture because they're still perched on the metal form Carl mounted them to more than 60 years ago. We can't know for sure how many of the birds currently on display in exhibits around the museum were created by Carl, but it's doubtful you can visit the museum today and not encounter some of his work. In fact, even staff here at the field are constantly uncovering work he contributed to. The seasonal plumage of the willow ptarmigan diorama had fallen out of common knowledge in the museum until it came time to move the striped hyenas for Project Hyena diorama, and this gem was rediscovered behind their case. At first, you can see Carl's ptarmigan in its snowy plumage set in a scene of a frigid Alaskan winter, painted by Matey Wiebe. Then, with a click, the bird and the scene are the same, but you have been transported in time to midsummer. This illusion is achieved by the creation of a matching pair of dioramas, one set straight on from the viewer's perspective and the other on the ceiling. A two-way mirror was placed at a 45-degree angle to the viewer, so when light is shown through it, we see the winter scene, and when the light is reflected off the mirror, we see the summer scene. While this may seem like a simple trick, its creation was no small task. Both Carl and Mady had to construct pieces of art that were perfectly matching in form and composition, but because a mirror is used to create the illusion, one diorama had to be a mirror image of the other. In talking with Carl's family, we learned about some of his work that definitely wouldn't be in the museum archives. In an apparent side hustle, Carl created and delivered a bearskin rug to the Playboy Mansion, which was located here in Chicago at the time. But it wasn't all so glamorous. 
According to Carl's wife, when a hippopotamus from the zoo died and was too large to fit in the freight elevator, Carl had to prepare it in the loading dock, which took several days in the heat and humidity of a Midwestern August. Carl's wife mentioned another less than pleasant task, replicating the same dinosaur vertebrae out of plaster over and over because visitors seeking a souvenir couldn't help but snag the tip of gorgeous George's tail, which was just within reach when the specimen was on display in Stanley Field Hall. Who knows how many people have a plaster vertebrae handmade by Carl Cotton stashed somewhere in their homes by a slightly ashamed parent or grandparent. Carl eventually branched out of taxidermy to create insect display cases. His experience as an urban taxidermist is epitomized in this tiny diorama of a mouse being consumed by carrion beetles. The slight bloating of the mouse and the interaction between the beetles gives the feeling of a very lively death scene. But perhaps his astounding attention to detail is shown nowhere better than in his masterpiece, the Marsh Birds of the Upper Nile River Diorama, which he constructed in 1953. By then, Carl had demonstrated vast capabilities in both his taxidermy of diverse animal groups, as well as his mold making and crafting abilities. So when the museum announced the expedition to Uganda with the goal of creating a new bird diorama, Carl was ready for the opportunity. He was involved with the display from its very inception, including preparing and packing the supplies for the expedition and unpacking the specimens once they returned to the museum. He worked on all aspects of the diorama, from building the habitat, to sculpting and painting the lily pads, to the taxidermy of every one of the 31 birds. It was a big responsibility and required a tremendous amount of work, but he was up to the task and devoted two years to the project, from the beginning of the expedition to the opening of the diorama in 1953. In the footage from the Field Museum archive, you can see the care and attention he gave to every animal he mounted. As you approach the diorama, you're transported to a vast wetland on the edge of Lake Cayoga in June of 1952. The sky is nearly empty despite the many birds on the ground, signifying that these are native birds, still here after the migratory birds from Europe have gone for their summer. The entire scene is packed with life, giving the impression of an abundant and diverse environment. Perhaps not representing a single moment in time, but giving the impression of what someone sitting in this spot might see over the course of a few days. It's somehow a truer impression of the habitat than a single instant could show. You get the feeling that you, and not the animals in the diorama, are the center of attention. It's as if you just stumbled out from behind the papyrus and have caught the notice of each bird. The shoebill stork, being the largest and most fearsome predator in its own right, is vigilant but unconcerned. The smaller birds are more alert. The quick and skittish painted snipe begins to take flight. The great crested grebe and the long-toed plover both have young to protect, which is reflected in their anxious poses. The open-billed stork looks up from eating a snail, the evidence of past meals scattered around it, and the buff-backed heron is startled in the middle of preening, surrounded by lost white feathers. The scene feels complete because of such small details, like the different ages of the lily pads and the bird droppings clinging to the papyrus. You can almost feel the breeze coming from the right and smell the damp earth and muck in the water. And so the diorama accomplishes what any great work of art sets out to do. It moves the viewer outside of themselves. For a moment, if you allow it, you can become lost in another world, in another moment in time. You're lost in this masterful illusion of nature. Carl Cotton's incredible artistry wasn't only highly influential here at the Field Museum. His expertise in taxidermy and exhibition methods were sought out by popular and scientific institutions around the globe. Those he taught in turn pass on their knowledge, so there's no real way to know the true extent of his impact, but he continues to influence any visitor who happens to stop and admire the hundreds of examples of his artistry on display at the Field Museum, from the subtle to the grand. It still has brains on it.